Good afternoon. I'm going to give a, a framework for understanding how we might uh, do biomarker discovery to help us understand some of the potential contributors to, to MECFS. So you, to really to try to parse this heterogeneity into subsets that may be uh, meaningful in terms of causation uh, as well as in terms of potential treatment pathways. Uh, I think of these disorders, immune-mediated brain disorders in general, as being an intersection of three uh, sort of bad strikes, uh, genes, environment, uh, and, and timing, and thinking even prenatally uh, that there may be uh, in, inter uh, interactions of genetic factors that alter the course of development, interactions with environmental exposures writ broadly. I was very glad to hear the, uh, you know, des describing psychosocial stressors in addition to infection, xenobiotics, and uh, microbiome, uh, because these all um, have some uh, convergent pathways that uh, may be important. And these interactions uh, are mediated in part uh, by uh, changes in the uh, epigenetic profile, sort of the uh, histone and uh, uh, acetyl acetylation as well as uh, methylation patterns. And these can be laid down during uh, prenatal development and car be carried across into adulthood and over a lifetime um, with, uh, with uh, manifestations that can be in childhood like autism uh, and ADHD in middle uh, life, uh, MECFS, as well as mood disorders and MS, and in later life, Parkinson and Alzheimer's and, uh, and other degenerative disorders. And we do know that there have been some studies that, long-term studies, that have found that prenatal uh, exposures, these interactions during early development, may actually increase the risk of Alzheimer's in, you know, and par Parkinson in, la in later life. Uh, but they can also uh, affect earlier. So, um, so the age uh, at which this, these interactions occur, and there may also be mu multiple hits, uh, may be all important in terms of uh, determining outcomes. Our approach has been very wide in terms of biomarker discovery, from RNA-based uh, to uh, protein-based, as well as uh, DNA studies, um, and uh, trying to utilize these to help us to make these uh, meaningful subsets uh, that may tell us something about uh, disease pathways, as well as intervention pathways. Some of the characteristics that we've been interested in are things like how long has somebody been ill, duration of illness, uh, as well as uh, onset type, acute versus gradual, uh, age at onset. Are pediatric patients you know, fundamentally different than uh, patients who uh, have their first onset of ME in, in adulthood? I don't think we really have the answer to those, uh, to those uh, uh, questions as yet. Um, also, uh, high core morbidity, up to 70% of uh, individuals with ME will have something that may be called an atopic disorder. Uh, maybe it's not uh, always diagnosed appropriately, but including mast cell disorders, but also uh, seasonal rhinitis uh, as, and, and other types of symptoms. Uh, neurologic impairment, of course, is a very common manifestation in ME, with, with uh, brain fog being the largest driver of, uh, of disability uh, in, in ME. But we also know that some patients have more brain fog than others, and others you know, may have other manifestations being more severe. Um, and this also includes perceptual impairments and you know, sensory uh, sen the sensitivity to vi uh, visual or uh, auditory uh, cues as well. And in addition, uh, we and others have been really looking at gastrointestinal dysfunction, not just microbiome as a, uh, as a, as a mediating factor, but even uh, individuals who may have uh, celiac disease or other inflammatory bowel diseases, as well as irritable bowel syndrome. So I'm going to start just really talking about, uh, you know, very briefly touching on our work that really looked at immune markers uh, deviating early after manifestation of, of disease. Uh, within the first uh, three three years, uh, and uh, later on uh, uh, had faded to a, uh, a sort of an immune exhaustion paradigm. And we found that there were uh, a, a variety of pro-inflammatory as well as in the short duration uh, subjects that were increased, as well as uh, counter-inflammatory or, and or allergy-associated uh, um, uh, cytokines that were there up, but not all being up. So it wasn't just that there was more protein and, you know, and the short duration subjects were always higher. Um, so uh, eotaxin uh, was, you know, was uh, significantly um, 
uh, uh, increased only in the long group, so it wasn't always you know, one versus the other. And interleukin-1 receptor antagonists also suggesting some IL-1 uh, pathways that may be dysregulated. Interferon gamma in this study had a very high uh, uh, odds ratio of predicting uh, short versus long, uh, differentiating between short and long duration uh, MECFS, uh, but a very huge uh, confidence interval suggesting that there are more subsets in there that, uh, that you know, so going from uh, you know, uh, 6.9 to you know, 1574, that suggests that there's some meaningful subsets that may be in there if we only knew how to parse them out, which string to pull to make things come into view. More recently, we've looked in the central compartment, looking at spinal fluid, and also found that there are differences between patients who have a classical presentation of MECFS with a viral-like illness uh, as, uh, versus those who have a more atypical either presentation or course over time. And uh, these individuals um, had uh, uh, onset later on of, uh, of, of cancer, uh, immune or inflammatory uh, diseases, uh, but may have also had a presentation that occurred after encephalitis, uh, foreign travel, or blood transfusion, or may have had a Gulf War illness uh, and it prior to the onset of ME, or may have developed a more atypical seizure-like uh, scenario. And so we were interested to see in the uh, central compartments what uh, what uh, might this look like, and uh, comparing in particular to our prior work in classical ME versus MS as a comparator group and no disease controls, where we found disruption of interleukin-1 signaling. Here we found uh, some important uh, uh, molecules for uh, white blood cell, in particular T-cell uh, uh, you know, T-cell differentiation, uh, IL-7, being quite low, extremely low um, in, uh, in individuals with um, atypical uh, scenarios uh, and as opposed to those with the classical uh, uh, scenario. IL-17A was also much more likely to be low in, it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine that actually is regulated by gut bugs that are uh, important in, in causing inflammation and shaping your uh, immune system, and CXCL9 uh, also being uh, reduced. And the, uh, the networks were really quite sparse. There seemed to be you know, sort of not a lot of regulation, which you should normally see um, in the classical ME. You see that there uh, are uh, these red lines, which mean there's like uh, negative feedback, whereas you see very little of that in the uh, atypical group. So you know, we uh, had found really that there was a you know a blood brain uh, barrier disruption um, that uh, might be uh, a, a potential uh, downstream consequence of uh, um, of higher levels of uh, IL seventeen A. Uh, but we found lower levels in the atypical group. So we found that this was you know, less likely uh, based upon our cytokine patterns in the central nervous system in the atypical group. But these were actually before the individuals had developed some of these unusual consequences, including uh, neoplasm, neoplasms and, uh, and uh, seizure disorders as, as well. So these were at the baseline prior to the uh, onset of those other illnesses. So it was predictive at the time uh, when they were first being diagnosed with uh, MECFS. And they did fulfill the usual criteria uh, for uh, MECFS, uh, even though they had a slightly more unusual presentation or precursors. Um, we also know that when uh, the uh, receptor for CXCL9, which was de decreased in uh, these, uh, these subjects, interferon gamma and uh, uh, TLR4 are inducers of CXL9, when, that, when the receptor for that is unavailable, CXCL9 can't signal, you have reduced activation of, uh, of, uh, of microglia. So this may actually, you know, if, if in classical ME we're thinking that there may be microglial activation, this group may actually have potentially less microglial activation. And the IL-1 signaling deficits uh, that were seen in classical ME were really not seen in the atypical group, suggesting that there's, in the central compartments, there are some uh, altered uh, means of regulation. We've also been thinking about allergic disorders. Again, those are very high prevalence uh, in, uh, as, a, as a larger group, including mast cell uh, abnormalities. And along with uh, a clinician uh, in New York, one of our 
uh, clinicians in our uh, network uh, for our studies, as uh, Susan Levine. We've been looking at this uh, to see whether there are differences in the other comorbidities that occur, the domains of dysfunction in patients who have, uh, who report uh, al allergic or atopic, atopic disorders, and thinking about whether there's maybe a shared diathesis that is, you know, converging in the, the uh, uh, pathogenesis of these disorders. And uh, we have, um, you know, we, we think about allergic disorders, you know, as having a release of histamine, even if it's not, it's very br uh, briefly found uh, in, uh, in most samples, as you just heard from Dr. Th uh, Theoretis. Uh, but we, we know it has a wide, wide range of uh, functions uh, across many uh, organ systems. And, and, and uh, addressing, you know, sort of covers many of the symptoms that we often find in, uh, in ME-CFS, so it's a great overlap. What we found in terms of overlap in the allergic ME-CFS subjects versus those who did not have uh, uh, allergic disorders here being sinusitis and hives, we found that there was increased pain, uh, there were GI, greater level of GI disturbances, higher levels of endocrine disturbances, not only including thyroid, but other, uh, other uh, endocrine disorders, as well as uh, inflammation. And pain report and uh, uh, GI and endocrine all uh, were um, uh, important in the uh, final model that we, that we selected for predicting the group with the allergic uh, phenomena. But um, actually, you know, pain uh, was actually a little bit lower uh, in, uh, in this particular group with the sinusitis uh, hives. And of course, sinusitis also could be infectious, but these patients were reporting uh, that they you know, didn't have uh, ongoing infections or antibiotic use. Um, we are also interested in neurologic impairment, as I indicated. You know, again, it's something that is a, a core feature of, uh, of MACFS, but some patients uh, have it more severely, and it is associated highly with disability and severity of disease. Uh, and the, there's been very little work uh, on the sensory processing or really thinking about patients who are having more cognitive and sensory dysfunction uh, versus less. So we try to uh, begin, and we haven't really finished all the testing yet, but we uh, have uh, had begun by using what's called a cluster analysis to look at all of the data we had available to us to derive an algorithm for defining this group. And so we're using this uh, uh, cluster one uh, group with a hot, with uh, where they have uh, more dysfunction in these uh, these parameters, these cognitive and sensory parameters, and looking to see how that correlates with uh, peripheral immune dysfunction, and eventually, hopefully, we'll also have spinal fluid samples in uh, in other cohorts to be able to look at the central uh, immune regulation. Lastly, I'm going to focus on GI dysfunction. And uh, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, as you had heard earlier, is also you know 70, 80 percent, very high level. We know that there's a gut-brain axis that is likely to be very important in regulating our normal health as well as disease, not only in, M uh, in ME, uh, with immune molecules uh, uh, having. Uh, receptors that read the immune molecule, uh, you know, information uh, in the brain, particularly in the hypothalamus or interleukin-1, beta, and, and, and others, and vagus nerve having an important regulation on TNF-alpha and other pro-inflammatory uh, signaling. Uh, we used a, a stool microbiome uh, doing uh, metagenomics and uh, also uh, predicted bacterial metabolomics uh, in 50 cases and 50 controls um, and controlling for a variety, you know, matching on a variety of uh, factors. And using a topological data analysis really looked to see how data clustered together um, in space informing us about clusters of, uh, of, uh, of subjects. And so we found that uh, in the blue here, uh, just naturally, this is unsupervised. Basically, you throw all the data in, and then you ask the program to uh, see what you know, seems to be associated with, with, one, with each other. And each of these circles represents uh, any number of subjects. Could be one subject. Could it be you know? Could be all a hundred? Or you know? And, and the connectors are saying that there's some variables that are shared uh, uh, between them. And here we see differences in the uh, in the structures without just empirically letting the data speak to. Us, uh, without IBS in blue, and then the with IBS group uh, in red, and then the controls uh, falling out here. 
um, we found that there were differences in these groups uh, for uh, MECFS versus uh, controls, MECFS as a whole, uh, with IBS versus controls and without IBS in the bacterial profiles, as well as in the met uh, metabolomic profiles. In particular, you know, atrazine, which I think was mentioned earlier, is that, you know, herbicide uh, is higher in all of these uh, groups and is something as a, a herbicide, a contaminant of water uh, throughout the U.S. and has endocrine disruption effects as well as a whole host of other effects. And we found differences, though, in uh, vitamin B6 uh, pathways uh, that were only seen to be elevated uh, in the uh, without IBS group uh, and in the total IBS group, but the so subjects who had IBS uh, had um, a different uh, metabolic profile. Again, predicted, we didn't measure the metabolites, but we looked at which ones would be predicted based upon the uh, bacterial species uh, and their gene and their, their genes um, that, were, that were present. So uh, these uh, sort out differently in terms of clinical uh, function, as well as with some of the uh, some of the plasma cytokines, but uh, but not all. So uh, with uh, IBS B and uh, also high uh, without IBMS uh, without IBS with high BMI, um, high BMI with IBS uh, sorted out differently, and then the uh, ME group that had IBS that had a normal B, uh, BMI had uh, a whole, you know, a different profile. So we think that these can help us over, over time to identify subsets that may be meaningful. We need to see whether these are stable profiles over time or whether if the patient has uh, a shift in their uh, fatigue levels uh, or fatigue ratings, uh, do these, are these disease associated or are they state associated? So, you know, if their disease fluctuates, um, uh, in severity over time, which one of these bi uh, these um, biomarkers are going to be stable? Which ones fluctuate and may tell us something about predicting uh, response to treatments, perhaps, or you know, uh, and helping in monitoring of disease? We were particularly interested, as I said, in the atrazine degradation. Um, it's second only to in the U.S. to glyphosate as a, as a, 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 an herbicide. Um, and uh, is a potent endocrine disruptor. And so, you know, that is a, a, quite a concern. It's very high uh, levels of water contamination uh, in U.S. often not even tested for, so many local water sources may have atrazine uh, contamination. And uh, in uh, some groups with the um, increased vitamin B6 usage, you know, the question might be, uh, is there then uh, f reduced... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, is, is there a stress on the on the on certain pathways that require B six, um, and perhaps you know, ultimately maybe that. Uh, there may uh, be a, an exhaustion over time if you're not taking in enough B6. Some of your bacteria will synthesize B6, but you have to have the right blend uh, to, uh, to be able to do that. So we're really interested in taking that further and seeing where it goes. We're also then taking that in the same population, uh, hopefully have a patient paper soon, um, on the plasma metabolomics in the same population to see which ones may have come out from the gut or been transported like short-chain fatty acids into uh, the bloodstream of these, of, of these subjects, so we'll see that soon. We know that these metabolites as well as uh, cytokines can affect blood-brain barrier. If one is thinking about uh, a variety of uh, pathways from the periphery into brain to lead to the disorder uh, of, of MECFS, one needs to uh, think about how you get things to the brain. One way is through blood-brain barrier degradation. We can do that through cytokines, um, and we can also do that through uh, uh, changes in uh, short-chain fatty acid. Uh, as, as well. So some of these uh, are ones that we can manipulate. Um, you know, butyrate, uh, you, you can get, you know, over the counter, I understand. Um, and uh, so there are, you know, ways in which one can do that, or, or propionic acid, and they have differential effects as either anti-inflammatory or uh, pro-inflammatory uh, types of uh, types of agents. Lastly, I just want to you know remind us all that you know diet is really critically important. It, you can uh, there are certain substances like tryptophan that are important both in the uh, production of serotonin and the downstream 
synthesis of melatonin, a circadian rhythm, and sleep regulating uh, agent, as well as in uh, the uh, possibly being degraded down the kynurenin pathway and leading to a whole host of metabolites that have effects on glutamate systems and uh, 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 which can be excitotoxic as, as well. And regulation of the system or disturbance of the system can happen through this enzyme called dolamine 2,3-dioxygenase. And here's the list of agents that are known to also alter the, the, that scenario. Um, this is that kynurenin pathway spelled out a little bit more. What's intriguing to me, again, I think we were talking about stress and infection as well as other types of uh, factors potentially leading to uh, you know, alterations that may be consistent or contributory to, to, uh, to something like ME-like scenarios. And here you see that there's two enzymes that are present. Um, uh, both in uh, the periphery and white blood cells, as well as in brain, and dolomine 2 3 dioxygenase uh, can be activated by cytokines, including uh, interferon gamma, TNF alpha, IL 1 beta, that would be, uh, those would be increased under conditions of viral infection, whereas stressors that might increase glucocorticoids can activate the enzyme two, uh, uh, tryptophan 2 3 dioxygenase that takes you that shunts tryptophan away from serotonin and melatonin synthesis down this pathway to quinolinic acid, which is an excitotoxic uh, agent that can actually you know, help you just knock off some of your neurons um, through, uh, through various pathways. But it also is important, quinolinic acid is a precursor for an essential uh, you know, essential molecule of NAD+, which is important in electron uh, transport redox reactions, as well as uh, in extracellular signaling and a host of other functions. And if this pathway is not operative at all, you have memory and immune dysfunction. And uh, if it's overoperative in a white blood cell and a T cell, it will shift it from a Th1 uh, pro-inflammatory type cell to a Th2 autoimmune type uh, uh, T cell. Um, whereas in brain, it uh, can actually lead to uh, uh, impairment in uh, synaptic uh, processes if you're if you're not you know contributing to this process. Lastly, I want to uh, you know think we think a lot about the potential for autoimmunity to contribute to this disorder. Autoantibodies have been found that may target uh, you know uh, uh, blood vessel uh, and blood pressure regulating molecules like the, the adrenergic receptors. And this may actually, you know, occur in the GI tract, potentially. This is in your terminal ileum, one of the areas that's most metabolically active in your body. Um, and microflora uh, products can alter the availability of glutathione, which is a very critical antioxidant, um, with through, the, uh, uh, through both the um, activity of selenium and as well as the availability of cysteine, and uh, with glutamate, uh, with uh, excited toxic amino acid transporters, uh, also being uh, important. And so you can have scenarios where there are changes in the structure of uh, receptors that are there in your intestinal tract to capture uh, antibodies, uh, to capture dietary components like folate uh, and so forth, and then you can uh, lead to a skew that leads to receptor uh, autoantibodies against you know, the antifolate uh, receptor autoantibody. So this is the failed uptake of these dietary antioxidants. Uh, and their pre precursors in the terminal ileum may predispose to that. On top of that, certain microbes may also uh, lead to more pro-inflammatory uh, effects with Th17 and more uh, IL-17 production by those Th17 cells and reduction in the counter-regulatory T regulatory uh, uh, cells as well. Um, lastly, there's a, a, a scenario uh, that has been mapped out both in humans and in, and in mice where uh, this uh, uh, scenario has uh, come to be uh, a, an inducer of antibodies against the alpha MSH uh, and uh, that this is a mimic, a mimic of the, uh, a certain sequence, CLPB heat shock protein sequence in a commensal uh, e. coli. Um, and that this, these same antibodies have been found in eating dis disorder patients. If you give this heat shock protein uh, to, uh, to mice, they develop those same cross-reactive antibodies that react against this E. coli sequence as well as against alpha MSH and uh, will reduce food intake, uh, they lose weight, and they have more anxiety, and there's a, an abnormality in the signaling pathway. And these are present in eating disorder 
uh, patients. So uh, these are, you know, these are the uh, some of the hooks that we're using to try to understand the heterogeneity and to parse it out into something uh, that uh, is meaningful uh, biologically in terms of biologic pathways, brain fog. Uh, the uh, atopy, uh, IBS, or other GI disturbances, and trying to think about ways in which we can not only use the cl clinical phenotypes, medications, look at the exacerbatory factors, the co course over time, but add in some additional ratings that may help us with uh, more sensitively getting, particularly for moderately severe to severe ME, getting more uh, of a range uh, to be able to actually measure small differences so that we can uh, predict with better accuracy where, you know, where things are going and if something might be working, um, and expanding the range of, uh, of markers use a variety of uh, 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 deep data mining uh, te uh, techniques to do this. Again, we're thinking about this and putting together the genes, the environment, and the timing as uh, important aspects of these, uh, of these models, um, and, uh, and then really trying to think about, uh, in terms of the genetic component, if there's an environmental component, be it infection or stressor or uh, you know, a toxicant or you know, something in the diet, um, we are trying to think about environmental susceptibility genes. Uh, we need to power up our studies uh, uh, sufficiently to be able to capture this. If we don't really know what the uh, environmental factor is, or if we don't really know what the genetic uh, factor is on either side, if we're doing a study just looking at one or the other, we have to have a 400% increase in the size of the population to statistically uh, detect uh, these, these phenomena. Um, and so, you know, we want to be able to look at uh, both the, uh, the environmental exposures as well as uh, the genetic uh, variant that may be leading to the risk, like an HLA gene or, you know, or other uh, immune system re related uh, uh, phenomena. And, uh, you know, I think that we, we need to be looking at a wide range of uh, phenomena, thinking about cofactors, toxicants, vitamin D. Um, stressors in addition to infections or microbial changes in the microbiome or in uh, or in viral uh, uh, or other bacterial exposures uh, to understand this and to you know and to get some clarity there. So uh, I love this quote. You know, really that we our tools are always changing, right? Um, and so the questions you know may be the same, but with the advance in the tools uh, and the way in which we look. Um, maybe the answers uh, may be different. So let's not, you know, give up trying and looking. Thank you. Thanks very much. Question, yes, James. Yeah, Jim Baranek, I'm a board certified allergist and have published on how there's equivalence between CFS and controls for the objective biomarkers of allergy in uh, CFS. And I'd just like to know how your results compare for the objective markers of IgE, allergy skin tests, um, peripheral and nasal eosinophilia, which we've used for over a hundred years as objective biomarkers of allergic disease. Yeah, that point is extremely well taken. We um, have the uh, advantage uh, of having, uh, you know, sort, uh, sort of some, some, some depth of, of clinical data, but the report by patients is all we're using in these, uh, in these studies. And we're using variants of uh, many of the instruments. Some of these are in the common data elements even. And I think we have to be very cautious um, when we're interpreting these data. So I think that point is extremely well taken. We do know that using the same tools uh, controls report these disorders less. So we have, there, there is something robust from that standpoint in terms of their self-report, but the objective measures, we have not a clue because we've not looked at those yet, um, except in the sense of the cytokines that may be allergy associated. So we, we're, you know, that's, a, that's an important limitation and uh, you know, we hope that we'll have uh, additional funding to be able to do this in more depth and to plan studies to get the right types of measures that will allow us to make those uh, important distinctions. Thank you very much indeed, Maddie. Thank you very, very much.